Bonjour, welcome to Wa Citizens Education Center's radio Zoom classes. This is SVN 3E, Grade 11 Workplace Science, and I'm Bronwyn Slade. If you'd like to participate live today, you can call the WASA studio at 1-800-465-7144 or 737-4017. You can listen on the radio of 90, at 91.9 FM and on the television at Bell Express View Channel 972. You are always welcome to join me live through the Zoom link, which is available from me, your teacher, and also your DEC. Our classes are scheduled Monday through Thursday from 10 to 11 in the morning, and we are in our ninth and final week of our nine-week course. So a reminder, the key questions are listed at the end of each of your IL lessons. You need to do all of them. Some are check your understanding questions, some are activities, and some are review questions. Please explain your ideas and thoughts in complete sentences and make sure you're actually answering the question that is being asked. You can do this by hand or electronically. If you're going to do it by hand, you're welcome to write in your workbook. It is yours to take notes or to write in, but the spaces for the review questions in particular are not very large so i strongly encourage you to write on a separate piece of paper in order to hand in your work in a clear way if you're going to hand it in electronically pdf word and google files are the easiest ones for us to access google doc files everyone has access to through their nnec email address and we're happy to walk you through how to do that if you need help if you need to use a different type of file, most likely it is fine. Just let us know so we can make sure we can open it. So how do you submit your work? There's three different methods. The first is to send your work in electronically. If you've done it by hand, you can scan it with a device. The Apple devices have a Notes app that comes with it for free, and the Android devices have a Google Drive app that ha comes with it for free. So you can use those to scan if need be. If you need to take pictures, that's fine. They're just scanning in our smaller files and a little bit easier for us to manage. Then you can send it to studentwork at nnec.on.ca and you need to CC it to John, who is the course marker now. His email address is jstradiotto at nnec.on.ca. The second method is to drop your work off in Sioux Lookout at our location at 74 Front Street with the bright red building next to the post office. And we have a small white mailbox next to our side entrance. We are not yet open to the public, but hopefully soon. For now, just continue to put your work in that mailbox and we'll get it back to you as soon as we can. The third option is to hand your work into your DEC. Your DEC can either send your work through the express or fax it to 807-737-1732 or toll free fax to 1-800-463-7852. If you'd like to connect with me through social media, both my Facebook and my YouTube channel are under the name B Slate Wassa. If you friend me on YouTube, sorry, friend me on Facebook and subscribe to my YouTube channel, you'll get notifications every time I upload one of our lessons. All of our radio Zoom classes are recorded and uploaded to YouTube under a playlist called SVN3E. And all of our supplementary videos that are available on YouTube are also listed there so you can access them from their primary sources. Science is really visual. I incorporated as many videos, diagrams, charts, graphics, illustrations that I can in order to really help understand what it is that we're talking about. So I strongly encourage you to access the videos, either joining me live through Zoom or accessing the YouTube videos on your own time. If you do not have access to reliable internet, this is completely understandable. So please just let us know and we can send you a copy of all of our recordings. If you have any questions or concerns, please reach out to us here at WASA. We are here to help. If you want to talk directly about the course material, as according to these videos, please contact me. My email address is bronwyn.slate at nnec.on.ca and my Facebook is bslatewasa. If you wanna talk about something related to the assignments or marking, contact John and his email address is jstradion, sorry, i-o-t-t-o at nnec.on.ca. You can call us both at the main 
office at 807-737-1488. Extension 2209 is my extension. 2210 is John's extension. You can also call us toll free at 1-800-667-3703. John's office hours are Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 3.30, although he takes lunch from 12.30 to 1.30 and is not available then. I think it's really important to position myself within the context of this course as my educational experience shapes how I teach. I have white settler ancestry. I have white privilege, and this has shaped how I experience education, making it easier for me and having I'm having less barriers than other folks. I recognize this and while I cannot change that, I continue to work towards disrupting the cycle and making changes to our education system. I live in Northwestern Ontario on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe people. And I work to incorporate this culture and knowledge into our science courses. As an educator, I have lots to learn and unlearn and this is a lifelong journey that I'm committed to, though I will make mistakes. Our textbook is also Eurocentric, meaning that it centers the white experience in both the communities that it showcases and also the scientists that it refers to. It ignores Indigenous, Inuit, and Métis knowledges and experiences, and this is problematic and disappointing. Unfortunately, I've not been able to find another resource, and when I'm no longer responsible for this course at the end of Term 1A, I will not be able to, it will not be my job. Uh, and my priority to find this. Hopefully WASA will continue to look for more meaningful resources. All right, so we are in our last week. This is our review week. Uh, every day this week, we will review one or two units. There are seven chapters in your workbook that we covered. Um, so we have four days. So most days we'll be reviewing two units. So our final assessment is not an exam, but a culminating assignment. So it is a final project that you need to do. It covers all 23 of the lessons. So you can integrate knowledge that you learned from all 23 of the lessons. It's not like it says, this is unit, this is from lesson 17. This is from lesson five. It's you integrate your understanding from all of them as they, all of those lessons are very interconnected. Science is very interconnected and this really shows how we have things that were may have felt very disconnected as we went through them, but you can see how they are connected. It is an open book assignment. So you have access to your assignments. If you have handed them in and return and I've returned them, then you have marked assignments. Otherwise, uh, you don't. At this point, you are not going to get anything that you handed in at this point will not get back to you before your culminating assignment um, is completed or needs to be completed. So maybe you want to keep a copy of your assignment so that you have your own answers. But you can have access to all of the YouTube videos, all of the supplementary videos, everything that we did talked about through our lessons. And you have access to your IL booklet in case there's any information in there that you find to be useful. It is not timed. It's not like an exam where you only have two hours, but you do have a deadline. So that deadline at this point is June 10th. It is the end of this week. So if I get it to you, if you hand in your work and I give you your assignment, then you have until the end of this week to complete it. And the structure might be like, is a bit unfamiliar. It's not exactly uh, like your work has, our all course has been very direct answering questions, individual textbook questions. And this assignment is not like that at all. All right, so let's look at the lessons in the first two units. So lesson one was components of soil, water, and air. So just to go over our highlights, and then we're going to answer some of the review questions. So soil is made up of air, water, minerals, and organic materials. Uh, the mineral composition of soil affects the porosity. So how the sand, if it's made up of how much sand in comparison to silt and clay, and how all those three ratios work up, uh, affects how easily the water runs through the soil. Water, we talked about how it's a universal solvent because it has polarity. So all of the molecules are polar. And that means that any polar substance that it comes in contact, the positive ions 
are able to attract the negative ions of the other solvent and the, or the other solution, and the negative ions attack the positive, attract the positive ions in the solution, and so then that we're able to dissolve and break up those other solutions or materials. We talked about the water cycle, which hopefully is fairly familiar to you in terms of how our water cycles through our systems. And uh, then we talked about how acids and bases work and the pH scale. We got a bit of understanding that so that we can move later move on to acidic precipitation. Then we talked about air and how it's made up of various gases. It's not just oxygen, particularly, I believe 79% is made up of our air is made up of nitrogen and then carbon and oxygen are also a very strong presence. Okay, so what I decided to do for uh, part of review is to answer a few of the review questions from each lesson uh, just so that to little, engage in these topics a bit. Um, don't copy my answers down exactly and give them back to me as your answers that is not going to set you up for success. So number three on page nine, do you think one environmental sphere is more important than the other two spheres? Support your opinion with two or more supporting statements. So the spheres that are talking about are the air, water, and earth spheres. This is a, an opinion question. So it's not finding the right answer. It is sharing your thoughts and supporting it. So, I don't believe any sphere, any environmental sphere is more important than the others. So that is our first part, is making sure that we have a clear statement that I know. What do you believe? What's your, do you believe that there's one more important than others or not? And it's an opinion. I'm not asking you to repl replicate the same thing. I'm getting you, I'm asking you to have an opinion and back it up. So having support your statement with at least two or more supporting statements. So this is my opinion, I gave it to you. And now I need to give two supporting statements about why. Three spheres are interconnected share nutrients and minerals between them. Animals we get nutrients and minerals and the different spheres make them accessible to us. We can't get, we need nutrient, uh, so we need nitrogen in our systems, but we can't get it from the air. So the fact that the nitrogen cycles through the three spheres means it gets into a way that we are able to get it. Sorry, that was bad writing. It's hard to write on this little screen and talk at the same time. Question number seven, could you have good soil at a sandy beach near a lake? Explain your answer. I would say it is unlikely Good soil. This, I mean, for growing things. As it depends on why, what, how you put your value on. 
So good soil for letting high porous soil so that lots of water runs through it. Yes, it, that's going to be good. But for growing things, no. At a sandy beach. Because sand has a high porosity. Which means water runs through, takes nutrients away. I apologize for my messy writing. I'm trying to do it relatively quickly in order to cover lots. That might not be the most helpful. Okay, so this one I won't write out. I'll just answer quickly. Number 10, if you spill the liquid with a pH seven on your hands, should you be worried? Why or why not? You should don't need to be worried because pH is of seven is perfectly balanced between acidity and um, alkal alkalineness or basic. It's halfway between being an acid and a base. So that means that we will have both acids and bases the stronger they are, the farther they are from neutral, they are um, more likely to burn your skin and harm your hands. But with an acidity of seven, or sorry, pH of seven, means that it's no, not acid or basic, and therefore it will not uh, burn you. Okay, then let's look at lesson number two, the effects of human activity on soil, water, and air. So soil, we talked about the effects in terms of deforestation, urbanization, erosion, chemical fertilizers, and pesticides, industrial chemicals, and how they all destroy the soil. Then we talked about how recreational, industrial, and everyday human activities pollute our water. And then in terms of burning of fossil fuels that leads to air pollution and greenhouse gas, gas effect, and how the climate crisis has having is having detrimental effects on both humans and the natural world due to the air, our actions and air pollution and so there are new questions for this one number two many corn farmers leave the stalks of the corn in the ground after the corn has been harvested give one reason why this is a good method of helping to preserve soil so as the corn stalks biodegrade a return nutrients back into the soil another obvious suggestion another way you could look at it is that they help keep erosion um, as they hold down the soil and keep it connected so that they don't, uh, wet rain doesn't just wash away the nutrients. Number six, storm drains capture extra water on streets and typically drain straight into a river or nearby lake. Why can this be a problem for living things in the river or lake, especially after rain showers? So if we think about it, I'm gonna draw a diagram. You can draw a diagram sometimes. If we have rain that's all over the place really change your mind we know that our precipitation is acidic and then if we funnel all of this rain various places into a sewer sewer system we've taken all of that acidness and put it together and then we are dumping it into a natural body of water. You love my pictures, I know you do. I'm the best artist ever, I'm not at all. So what's going on is this can be a problem for the living things in the water is because yes, rain was gonna happen here, right? And a certain amount of rain, acidic rain would fall into the lake, but 
if all of the other rain, if it, instead of seeping into the ground, if it gets shuttled, shuttled into a sewer system, and then it all together goes into the lake, that means that all of this other acidic rain is being pumped into this lake, and therefore the acid level of this lake is going to increase, which means that the many of the plants and animals will not be able to survive because they can't survive in more acidic areas. All right, number 11. Describe the two changes in Earth's normal average weather conditions that are due to climate change. So one change is extreme precipitation. So by that, I, might, I mean like significantly no more snow. So this year in Sioux Lookout, and I think in probably most of Northwestern Ontario, we got a lot of snow. We had six months of heavy snow, basically the entire time from November until the end of April, middle of May even, was it, I don't even know when it went, went away. Basically we had three, four, five foot tall snow banks of snow. And then now we are getting consistent rain, a fair amount of rain. So that is affecting, we our snow melted really, really fast and has now all gone into our lakes and rivers and we are experiencing a lot of flooding because of um, this, the amount of snow that we had that melted really quickly and couldn't, the ground was saturated, it didn't have anywhere to go. So it just went, is holding in the lakes and rivers, which means that it's flooding um, and we're continuing to get rain. In other years, we have had really, really dry years. We have not had very much snow and we have not had very much rain. And so then we've been really susceptible to forest fires because everything's been really, really dry. So that extreme precipitation where some years we have a lot of precipitation and other years we do not have a lot of precipitation is a result of climate change and the climate, the weather patterns shifting and changing as um, with the, as the temperature of the earth is um, increasing. So along with that, so we have extreme precipitation, but we also have extreme storms. So we're having more hurricanes, more and stronger. And tornadoes in areas that didn't have them before. And these storms, these patterns are have shifted due to the change in the temperature of the earth. Okay, lesson number three. We are looking at common methods of sampling and monitoring soil, water, and air. So our highlights for this lesson, we talked about soil because we're monitoring sampling. So we talked about core soil testing and how we looked at soil profiles and how we get different information uh, at different levels of our soil. So top soils at the top, and then there were various horizons all the way down to bedrock. And each of these different layers have different nutrient compositions and different porosities different things going on and they add to the health of the soil in different ways. Then we talked about water and we talked about how water is sampled and tested. And we spent a bit of time looking at boil water advisories and how there are many places in Canada, particularly First Nation communities that have boil water advisories and do not have access to clean health water that is safe both for drinking consuming and also for um, washing much many indigenous communities have their water um, gives them uh, rashes or uh, boils on their hands on their skin 
and they can make them ill as well if they don't boil them, boil the water. So either people are boiling water in order to consume it or use it, or they are um, buying bottled water in order to have safe water. And this is really, really quite concerning. There has been some progress made um, in the last decade or so in terms of that shifting so that there's not as many um, boil water advisories, but still it is a concern. It is still an issue. And the fact that it is particularly an issue for First Nations communities and not uh, white communities or more urbanized communities is really, really problematic. This is not just an issue of being in a remote area. Um, in Southern Ontario, this is still an issue. And even in like, yeah, even though it's close to large urban populations, some First Nations do not have access to clean water. And then we talk about air quality. Um, we talk about how, because air Many toxins that are put into the air are colorless or scentless. And so there's no way to know just by sensing using our human senses. Um, so using a probe stacks, which is where much pollution is much, many chemicals are entered into our air. Um, so probes are put into stacks and then air is shuttled sort of out of those stacks to be tested and to make sure that there's not more of certain chemicals or vapors in the air that um, sorry lost my train of thought then the law and then there's there's certain laws about how much can actually be in there and then companies will have to change if they are not following the environmental rules I would talk about the air quality index in terms of measuring the outdoor air quality and is it safe for all of us to be out there or if breathing in that toxic air, um, how much of an effect it will have. In Canada, we are fairly like, lucky and we don't experience too much air pollution or smog compared to other places in the world. Yes, some places it definitely is higher than other places. Um, and yes, we are still are all impacted by air pollution but in some places in the world, it is uh, really quite substantial. Okay, so how do cover crops help improve soil quality? So cover crops, think back to this unit and think about how Cover crops help to make it so that there are not um, yeah they protect the soil from erosion so they shade Uh, cover crop shade other crops and help them grow this helps the soil health as Various nutrients are cycling through. Um, and it protects the soil from erosion. Similar to that core question, really. Number five, when a water sample is collected using the depth integrated sampling process, why is the sample called integrated? So remember we watched a video about, I'm gonna draw another picture. Um, 
where we had a vote. And we had a person sampled in the water. They had this really, really long tube and they put the long tube in and then they capped it. They pulled the long tube out and then they capped the bottom. And now there's water trapped inside the tube. But once they had that tube full of water, then they shook it. So the water sample is integrated because all of that water, it's not about layers. Think back to the soil where we had the soil profile showed us very distinct layers. In the water, we don't have distinct layers. Though things, there are things that are more common at the top and more common at the bottom, but so shaking that tube of water means that all of that water is integrated, it's shared about. So we don't know if this is something that's happening more at the top or the bottom, but really because uh, water is fluid and we don't know anyway, it's not, it's getting the general health opposed to thinking that we can find specific information about the top or the bottom, that's just not realistic. Number nine, why would people with asthma and other respiratory problems have to wear a breathing mask or stay inside if it, there was an increase in fine particulate matter in the atmosphere? So fine particulate matter are um, small particles, like dust. that when inhaled, irritate the lungs. So if you already struggle with breathing, can make it much more difficult. Okay, and that is lesson three. Now that was unit one. So now we're moving on. So we're talked about uh, those three spheres that are pretty essential to all life. And now we're moving on to lesson four, which is the beginning of chapter two. And we're now been talking about ecosystems. So lesson four was cycling of substances in ecosystems. So we talked about how there are living and non-living elements in an ecosystem. So the rocks, the soil, the sunlight, the air, all of those things are part of an ecosystem. They have an impact the temperature, the moisture content, and the like humidity and water content. Um, all of that impacts the ecosystem, right? So a dry desert, the lack of moisture means something different opposed to being in the rainforest where there's a significant amount of moisture. Those or a cool desert versus a hot desert, right? Like they, the temperature affects the climate or affects the weather and the the climate of the ecosystem opposed to is the overarching climate. And then there's living elements. So there are producers, consumers, and decomposers. So producers are plants that can take their nutrients and the things that they need from sunlight and from the soil and create their own, uh, putting those things together can create what they need to survive and to grow. Consumers uh, eat producers or eat other consumers that eat producers. Um, so generally animals, though there are some plants as well, insects, things like that. And then decomposers are the plants and animals that deal with the waste products from the product, the producers and consumers. And, and they're how to break down all of that matter. So these are like fungi and bacteria worms, there's a variety of different decomposers. 
So then we talked about the interconnected cycles of um, these substances. So what are the producers, consumers, and decomposers cycling through and um, reusing in order to sustain life? So particularly, we looked at oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And each of them had their different cycles that they, but these nutrients move throughout in different ways with help of the produced consumers and decomposers that they transfer from one state to another state. And then we talk about biosolids and how this is a method of dealing with human waste in terms of um, figuring out what to do with it and how it isn't just become waste or doesn't isn't just a pollutant, but how it can be helpful, though there are some concerns as well in terms of those biosolids um, using it as fertilizer or to help grow things. Okay, review questions. Number one, this is on page 35. Describe the difference in roles between a producer and a consumer. So a producer gets its energy from the sun, water, and soil, so the non-limping elements. Whereas consumers get their energy from living elements, I'm just gonna say. So that's producers, consumers, and decomposers too, I'm sure. And if I describe one key difference between natural ecosystems and human activity systems. So natural ecosystems have those producers, consumers, and decomposers. Human activity systems try to replicate, but human activity systems do not have very good decomposers. In a healthy, thriving ecosystem, natural ecosystem, then everything that they need to thrive and survive, they were able to get through that interconnectedness of the producers, consumers, and decomposers. There is an extra waste that is all used by those three groups and cycled through. So everybody gets what they need, and there isn't something that's polluting those ecosystems. With humans, we end up polluting the ecosystems because we don't have a good system of decomposing. We don't have a good system of getting rid of our waste, whether it's biosolids, or like human waste, or um, chemical waste from the manufacturing plants that we have, from the um, household garbage, think how much garbage is at the dump. Um, just all of those things we, we are consumed, we are, capitalism makes us really, really Tempted, really prone, really encouraged to consume. And then we are left with a bunch of waste and we don't have a good way of getting rid of it. We just dump it in the ocean, in the, on the land, shooting it into space, putting it in someone else's environment. Um, and this is quite harmful. Then we're actually concerned about the use of biosolids. So um, introducing metals and pharmaceuticals. I don't know how to spell that word. That's not right, but pharmaceuticals um, into our food, into our growing, into the environment that grows our food. What are the long-term impacts of that? We don't know. All right, then lesson five, how carbon footprints measure the impact of human activities. So carbon footprints we talked about in terms of it's a measure of the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that are produced. 
we talked both about this in terms of countries or larger cities or things, but also about the personal reflection of how we each have a carbon footprint. So there are inequities within this. The reality is that the white minority create the most emissions. So those with white privilege and um, the power that comes associated with that and disproportionate uh, wealth in white communities based on colonization and oppression, really. That's where that all comes from. Those folks are the ones who are creating the most emissions, they're having the greatest impact on our climate. And yet the global majority, the majority of the people in the world are not white. So these people are the ones who are most impacted, are gonna be the people who are the first climate refugees. There already are some. Um, these are the people who are having a harder time having access to clean water and healthy food. Um, these are the people who are losing their homes. I guess that would be climate refugee in terms of the, uh, like you think about Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans and how the poor population, which are the black populations were not, were had a higher hit rate um, not because the weather cares, but because of who was warned and who was able to get out first. And those were the white, the, with, the wealthy and the white were the people who were protected and the poor and the black communities were not. Um, so these, these cycles of oppression continue and are going to be, have a greater and greater impact as the climate crisis continues. So then we talked about reducing our carbon footprints and we talked about what are some individual actions that we can each take. And then also what is the structural change that needs to happen um, and how talking about how it isn't just an individual actions that are gonna make the difference in the long run, but really how it's about, we need to change our way our society works in order to actually make long lasting, meaningful change. So number four on page 43, if you purchase a bottle of water from France at your local store, what are some of the cradle to grave costs that are not included in the cost of the water? So cradle, that just means the life of the, um, of the cost of the bottle of water. So the extraction of oil to make the bottle plastic bottle, factory, costs and foods to make the bottle, bottle. Costs of shipping the bottle. This is going to use some sort of fossil fuel. Okay, because either by plane or boat, it's still going to take the shipment to come from France. Um, and then also uh, probably a truck to get from wherever it's shipped from. Like it doesn't, it's not gonna fly directly to your local store. So it's still gonna have to get trucked in. And then the uh, cost of disposal too. So, So is this recyclable? Get recycled um, or dump. Then identify three activities you could personally do to reduce your carbon footprint. So I could walk to work more often and not drive. I could Be conscious of my e-waste. Not upgrade my devices. 
and I could have one less child. Um, we know that it makes sense. The more, the more people populate, the more, the bigger the global impact. It's like a ripple effect. Okay, lesson six, how human activity affects ecosystems. So oil spills we talked about, and so we talked about how kelp and seagrasses die, but also how other algaes thrive and then become excessive. So then they um, steal oxygen and space from other plants and animals that need it. And many animals die in oil spills in the water. Um, similarly on land, forest and land animals also die due to pipeline leaks. So leaching of oil into the ground um, affects both the plants, spills the plants, and has a ripple effect on the animals as well. Oil spills have a greater impact generally on water because it is able to um, spread faster. Then we talk about acid precipitation. And so the increase of some nutrients and the decrease of other nutrients means that trees and other plants do not have what they need to grow strong. So acid precipitation cancel out some things, which means that plants don't have, don't have that they need, and then adds things to the soil that they that they might use, but it means that they are not necessarily as healthy. Lower pH levels in water are toxic to some animals and dramatically change food chains. So this um the cycle of that negatively impacts ecosystems, and that it can take years, decades to recover from both oil spills and acid precipitation. Um, there are development of laws, but really, it is a it's a really big issue, and we're not quite there yet. Our laws are not developing as fast as we're having impact on the environment. So, one describe ways. One way oil enters the ecosystem accidentally. Um, so oil drilling acts uh emergent, like accidents. <laughs> Can't think of another word for accidents that so I'm not using the same word, but um explosions. I wonder though if those can be really can as accidental because it's not like they're um, if we weren't there drilling they wouldn't happen and then intentional uh, we talked about how uh, in World War II I believe it was that releasing oil into the ocean was an act of war strategy and it had a huge impact on the natural environment. The number eight, using figure 2.16, describe how acid precipitation impacts on the release of key nutrients and heavy metals. So here, looking at this diagram, you can see how with the water, without acid precipitation, how there's aluminum, calcium, hydrogen ions, um, magnesium, the soil has a pH of 6.0, and there is more of some things than other things. Whereas, and how deep it goes, um, when we have acid precipitation, then we've increased aluminum, calcium, hydrogen ions, and magnesium. We've increased all the amount of all of them and how deep they pen penetrate, which means that they get into the lakes and streams or the underground water, um, which makes everything really much more acidic. And number 10, why is Ontario one of the provinces hardest hit by acid precipitation? Because we have a lot of manufacturing plants. So, and then also car transportation, like personal transportation. Fact that we have the highest population in Ontario. Most of our, a lot of our people live in Ontario, and therefore we have a lot of vehicles on the road. And then, quick before we run out of time, uh, lesson seven: invasive species affects monitoring control of them. So, native species are species that originally are thrive in an area, whereas non-native species uh, 
come from somewhere else and might do all right in the area, but they don't take over, whereas invasive species come from somewhere else and they take over and make it hard or impossible for the native species to thrive and survive. So there are monitoring systems in terms of checking and testing to make sure that ecosystems are not being impacted by non-native and invasive species. And there are databases developed for prediction for future change of these areas. And then there's a control, there's prevention, early detection and elimination and containment and management and then ecosystem restoration um, are how we control if invasive species are something of concern. So question number one, figure 2.21 illustrates the increase in the number of non-native or alien species over the past 200 years. Why have the numbers continued to increase? So looking at this diagram, you can see that really there was not a lot of invasive species in Canada, and then it dramatically changed in the 1900s. Um, so we can think about this is when travel has increased. So uh, many more people have come from other places in the world and along with people have come invasive species as well as um, shipping things all over the world. Things we, Now we have just so much interconnectedness of people and stuff all over the world that species are very easily bugs and um, animals, they, people ex import animals um, and plants come really, really easily from all over the place in the world and then invade our uh, ecosystems. Number five, explain how predators can help to control the population of invasive species. So I was thinking about the example of the beetle that I never remember um, and the purple loose leaf and how the purple loose leaf, sorry, the purple loose leaf is the, or loose strife, which is the plant that was taking over our marshes and then importing the uh, non-native species of the beetle, um, but they only eat the purple loose leaf. And so they are able to control that, whereas nothing else could. And that beetle doesn't eat anything else. It doesn't harm anything else. And then last, what do you think would happen if the control process failed after all methods of control were used? So then I, to me, I just feel like the invasive species would take over until we came up with another solution. I think that scientists would continue to test and continue to try things out and to problem solve, but it would be in a bit of a holding pattern of invasive species taking over until we could figure out something new that um, might control them. And that is our review of lessons or units one and two. Um, again, it was a super rush. It only can be a super rush. We have lots to cover. This is just a reminder of what we talked about, what we learned about over the course of this course um, and it's not meant to be a full full deep understanding so go back to the original lessons if you need to um, review anything thank you so much for joining me today i hope you have a lovely day and look forward to reviewing you with you for the rest of the week which